So let's go ahead and we'll get started. I, I want to open us in prayer for this message. I really do want to uh, bring the heart of God today. I, I really believe this is a, a message from the heart of God, and you know, you can obviously judge to see whether it is or isn't, but I want to open in prayer just so we really get the heart of God in this and what he's wanting to speak. So Father, we just come to you right now. Lord, we don't want to even battle what we're battling. Lord, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but we want to come to a higher place than just where we're at in the battle for America. And Lord, I pray we would come into your heart today. May, may we see today through your eyes, Lord. You say in uh, uh, Revelation 4.1, you told John, come up here. May we come up here. May we come up into the throne room of God and carry your heart, Lord, for this nation. Lord, would you breathe your life into this message, Lord, and let us carry your heart in, for America as intercessors, as watchmen, praying for this nation. In Jesus' name, amen. So as you know right now, we are in a battle for the heart and the soul of America. And so the battle is, will America remain a constitutional republic, or are we going to align with the antichrist system of global socialism that's rising up? So there's a false teaching today in the body of Christ that I, I want to just address just really quick. And th the idea is that Christians should not be concerned about the nations they live in. I don't know if you've heard it, but the, the, the idea is that because, we've been, because we were, when we were baptized into Jesus Christ, we, we're neither Jew nor Gentile, we're neither male nor female, we're neither American or Chinese, that's all true. But because of that, because of that teaching, it's now, therefore, we should only be focused on the kingdom of God, not of this world, and not on the nation that we live in. And I don't think that's true. I think, I think what's true is, that, yes, we have died to those things, but God wants us to be salt and light in the nation we live in. God wants us to have the kingdom of God influence the nation we live in. And, you know, for example, let me just read a couple, a couple scriptures. Jer turn in uh, your Bibles to Jeremiah 29, verse 7. And the Lord told Jeremiah living in Babylon. Listen, listen to what the Lord told Jeremiah living in Babylon. He said, seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will have welfare. Think about that for a second. For all the people that say we shouldn't be concerned about the destiny of the nation we live in, the Lord, tells, the Lord tells Jeremiah that, no, you are to pray for the nation where you live in. You are to pray for the city where you live in so that in its welfare you have welfare. Another one, it's a famous one, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, 1 through 2, is Paul told Timothy, first of all, I urge you that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men for kings and all who are in authority so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. And so I, the, the scriptures are very clear that wherever God has placed you, whatever city God has placed you, whatever country God has placed you in, we are to contend in prayer and in intercession for the destiny of that nation. It really does, may, it does matter in the heart of God. It really does matter in the heart of God. And so what I'm going to talk about today is contending for the destiny of America. God has a destiny for America. And we are to contend for that destiny in America. So here's the... Here's the thesis of this message, and I'm going to prove it in a minute. The, the thesis is end time Babylon is rising up. Revelation 17 and 18. I talked about that in the last, last week's message. I won't repeat it here, but you can go online and, and see it to talk what I'm, see what I'm talking about. But America, listen, America does not have to align with the Antichrist system of global socialism. I want us to get that for a second. 
We don't have to align with that. We do not, America does not have to align with end time Babylon. We can and we should resist the Antichrist system of one world government, one world economy, and one world religion. And we should pray against that for, in America. The destiny of America is to be a sheep nation. I'm going to explain what that means in a minute. Who resists the Antichrist government rising up in our day to become a refuge for God's people and to send forth the gospel of Jesus Christ into the nations. So that's really what I'm going to talk about today. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to prove this by looking at, I'm going to first of all dispel the myth. There's this idea that the Antichrist and his one world government are going to have complete control over every single nation so that if we try to even resist it, it's really futile because he's already going to have, God's already sovereignly decreed that would happen. I want to show you in Scripture why that's not the case. And I also want to establish the concept of sheep nations who will resist the Antichrist and become nations of refuge for God's people. So... It's a mouthful, but we're going to go into a lot today. Let's first talk about nations who resist the Antichrist. So there's this idea, and I've studied end-time prophecy for 20-something years, but there's this idea when it comes to end-time prophecy that God has sovereignly decreed that the Antichrist is going to have absolute, complete authority over every single nation, and that therefore to resist the Antichrist regime is, in, in fact, in essence, resisting God who sovereignly decreed that. I don't know if you've thought that way. It's a common thought process when you get into the end of the age where we become fatalistic and we just say God in his sovereignty is going to do it. Therefore, we should just sit, sit back. We don't want to resist God. That's kind of this mindset that's going on in the body of Christ. Now, I do believe there are some nations whose destiny has been sovereignly determined. Israel being the first one. God has, sovereign, has a sovereign plan for Israel and nothing and no one, no nation, no demon, nothing from hell can thwart that purpose. God has written it in scripture and it will come to pass absolutely. The second thing is I, I believe that in the, at the end of the age, we're going to have a teaching on this soon, but at the end of the age is coming, and I believe it's already in its infancy, a revived Roman Empire that God has sovereignly decreed those nations and that revived Roman Empire are going to align with the Antichrist. Now, the, in, in those nations, of course, you can resist it, but the nations themselves, I believe, are going to align with the Antichrist. I believe, I believe that's just part of what Scripture has written. It is written. But there's many other nations that God gives a choice to. Will we align with the Antichrist and his global government of worldwide socialism, or will we resist that agenda and see God's kingdom established in those nations to be a, a nation of refuge? So, if you look at, uh, let's look at real quick, I'm going to show you what I'm talking about here, because if this is something new to you, you might think, what are you even talking about? But I want you to see this in Scripture. Okay, Daniel, turn to Daniel 11, verse 40, and this passage is talking about the Antichrist at the end of the age rising up, and I'm, I want to take this Scripture and show you there are nations that fight against the Antichrist. Some are delivered and some are not delivered. But the point I want to make is that we are not just, just to lay down and say, come over and, you know, take over our nation because it is written. But there, there, are, there is a destiny determined for different nations. So 11, Daniel 11, verse 40. Daniel 11, verse 40 Again, it's talking about the Antichrist, but it says, At the end time, the king of the south will collide with him, collide with the Antichrist. So you see a collision with the king of the south, and you see, a, uh, and you see the king of the north will storm against him with chariots. So you see nations are not just submitting to the Antichrist, they are fighting the Antichrist, okay? So notice what it says in verse 41. 
He will enter the beautiful land, talking about Israel. Many countries will fall, but these will be rescued out of his hand. Edom, Moab, and the foremost sons of Ammon. That's talking about modern-day Jordan. In other words, what we see is this picture of, of nations rising up against the Antichrist. Some are defeated and some are victorious. Some escape and some are conquered. The idea being that the Antichrist is not going to have absolute authority over every single nation in the earth. That makes sense? Verse 42, then he will stretch out his hand against other countries and the land of Egypt will not escape. So you see, Jordan escapes, Egypt does not escape. Egypt's conquered. And so the point being is this, some nations will resist the Antichrist and escape. Others will resist him but be conquered. The, the point is, we should resist the Antichrist agenda that's rising up in America. We should not just sit back and say, well, it is written, you know, we're living in the end times. This should, you know, what, what can we really do? You know, we're going to be fighting against God. No, it is not the will of God for every single nation to be conquered. That makes sense? We want to fight against that agenda. Here's another scripture, Revelation 12, 13 through 16. I'm not going to read the entire, the entire passage, but... We, we see, and, and I'm not going to get even into the who is the woman, who is the eagle. I'm not going to get into that right now. But the, the basic idea is that the three and a half years of the beginning of the great tribulation, the woman is, is taken by a great eagle. I, I do not believe that is America, but I, we're going to just use it as a principle. The woman is taken by the great eagle, and this, and this great eagle takes her into the wilderness where she has protection against the Antichrist. The point I want to make is that there are nations, there are, there, are, there are parts of God's people that will have a place of refuge ordained by God. And that we are to contend for this nation to be a nation of refuge at the end of the age. It's interesting, I, this, I, I've kind of been very sentimental this Thanksgiving about our nation. I don't know if anyone else has felt that way. Just with what's all going on in our country and you know, just, just all, the, all the stuff we're going through. And I, I started reading The Light and the Glory by Peter Marshall. He goes through and he talks about the destiny of America and all that. And just seeing the, the sacrifice the pilgrims made. I mean, you don't, you don't really think about it, but the pilgrims, you know, you know growing up, you just kind of be like, that's what we talk about in kindergarten. We get, you know, candy corns and make hats and all that stuff. You don't really think about what, what they, the price they really paid to escape religious persecution. The, 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 uh, the pilgrims were separatists. They were, they, so in the Church of England, you had the Church of England, you had the Puritans who wanted to purify the Church of England from within, and then you had the separatists who said, no, we, there's no hope for the Church of England. we got to separate from the Church of England. And so the separatists came under incredible persecution. They, they fled to Holland where 12 years they... They were in Holland, but because they were refugees, they were not citizens, they had a very tough life. And so finally, by the providence of God, they realized, you know, God might be sending us to America. And one of the pastors who was of the, pure, of the, uh, of the pilgrims, the separatist, was praying about it, and he gave this message. And he says, we believe that God is sending us to America so that we could be a, we could build a temple for him, not made of human hands, but of living stones. We could be a model of the new Jerusalem that is to come. I mean, that's, that's pretty awesome, isn't it? So here they go. They, they go for four months in this, the hull of a ship where it's dark, it's stinky, you know, just the, the sacrifice they make. And then, you know, you get to, the, you get to America you know, get to the land, and there's no place you're even going to stay. I mean, I don't know, you know, Dad and I, we travel a lot to Africa. Man, by the time you have flown for like 24 hours, the, the only thing you want to do is you want to get into a nice hotel and go to sleep and eat some food. And I mean, but they get to America after four months, and there's nothing, you know? And just, to, and there's not no place, there's no place to sleep. There's no, nothing to eat. I mean, you know, the sacrifice they made, all, all to escape religious persecution, now, that's important because I believe that was that in and of itself is getting to the heartbeat of God 
for the destiny of America. There's another guy, I don't know if you've heard of John Winthrop. He's a Puritan who served as governor in New England for 12 of his first 20 years. Listen to this. This is amazing. He was praying about, so this, he's a Puritan. The other, the pilgrims were separatists. He's a Puritan. He wanted to purify the church of England from within. And so he's wrestling with God, John Winthrop. He's wrestling with God about, should I go? Should I go to America? Lord, what am I going to do? And he begins to journal down in his wrestlings with God why he should go to America. And he says that it, he, this is one of the things he says. He says, it will be a, this is one of the reasons why he's saying I should go. It will be a service to the church of great consequence to carry the gospel into those parts of the world. Now listen to this. To raise a bulwark against the kingdom of Antichrist. Isn't that interesting? Which the Jesuits labor to rear up in those parts. The Jesuits were uh, part of the Catholic Church, and they were fighting against the Reformation. The, the Puritans, the pilgrims, they were part of the Reformation. And so he said, we want to come to America to fight against the Antichrist rising up. Isn't that interesting? That's crazy. I, I think he was carrying God's vision for America. He goes on, point two. He says, all other churches of Europe are brought to desolation due to persecution. Who knows but that God has provided this place to be a refuge for, for many whom he means to save out of the general calamity and seeing the church has no place left to fly but into the wilderness, what better work can there be than to go and provide tabernacles and food for what comes against her? In other words, John Winthrop was writing down God's three-part vision for America, I believe. I believe. I believe he captured God's vision for America. Number one is that the gospel of Jesus Christ would come into this nation and go out into the nations and, and, and be that, that sending center into the nations of the earth, which we have done. The second thing is that, the, that America would resist the Antichrist and his agenda now, obviously, in his time, it was different than ours, but at the end of the age, we're seeing the Antichrist government rise up, and America is meant in the heart of God to resist that end-time agenda. And the third thing is that America would be a nation of refuge that would be that place where God would protect his people who are encountering persecution. I believe that's the heart of God for America. Many historians have tried to say, what's the, you know, the purpose of America is this and the purpose of America is that. I believe, I believe with all my heart, if you go from just in God's heart, God's heart for America, the destiny of this nation in terms of God's heart is that we would resist the Antichrist, we would be a nation of refuge from persecution, and we would send the gospel out into the nations. That's something we need to fight for. That's something we must contend for. We cannot just be passive as, as forces rise up in our nation that are contrary to God's destiny and say, whatever will be, will be. Whatever is written, will be written. Whatever, you know, and what I'm saying, we got to fight for God's destiny in this nation. God's heart for America is that America would be a sheep nation. Now, what does that mean? I'm glad you asked. Because I'm here to tell you. No, I'm kidding. But America, in God's heart, is to be a sheep nation. Now, you may have never heard that terminology before. I'm going to explain it to you right now. So turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 25. We're going to look at the parable of the sheep and the goats. And I would encourage you just to, just to read through Matthew 25. We're not going to read the entire chapter here, but days before the cross, the disciples come up to Jesus and they say to him, Lord, this is Matthew 24, it's known as the Olivet Discourse, Lord, what is the sign of your coming and the, uh, and the end of the age? And so they ask him this question, you know, tell us about when you're coming, tell us about the end of the age. And the Lord answers in Matthew 24, and we have talked about in a previous teaching why that is not 
describing something that happened before 70 AD or it was fulfilled in 70 AD is not. Um, and then he goes on in Matthew 25 and he gets to this parable, the parable of the sheep and the goats. And so what, what have, what, now notice what he says, verse, verse, uh, he says specifically, he says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, what's he describing? The second coming. See, he's talking about the second coming of Christ. He's talking about his second coming. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and, um, and all the na- angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Where, where is that? It's in Jerusalem. Jeremiah 3.17 At that time, they will say, the throne of the Lord, the throne of the Lord. Because the Lord Jesus Christ is coming, Zechariah 14, and his feet are going to touch the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. And he's going to set up his glorious throne in Jerusalem. So context is so important here. You got that? You with me so far? And the Lord says in verse 40, He's going to judge the nations based upon these brothers of mine. Well, who are the brothers of the Lord? I believe it's Matthew 12, 50. Whoever does the will of my Father who is in heaven, he is my brother. It's the the body of Christ. It's the body of Christ who has the indwelling life of Christ. These are my brothers. These are my sisters. But I also believe it's not only the church of Jesus Christ. I also believe he's talking about the nation of Israel. If you look at Joel chapter 3, 1 through 8, you see see the very same thing happening. It's the judgment of the nations. And you see specifically the Lord enters into judgment with the nations based upon, verse uh, Joel 3, 2, based upon my people and my inheritance Israel whom they have scattered among the nations. So in summary then, the Lord's brothers, I believe, is his body, the church, and the Jewish people, Israel. Now I'm going to go into this in a lot more detail in a minute. So reading through the parable, what you see is you see the Lord entering into a judgment, uh, a judgment upon the nations for how they treated his church and how they treated Israel. If they cared for and and cared for them when they were in prison or hungry or sick or thirsty or naked or whatever, homeless, then they entered into the kingdom, which is, I believe, the millennial kingdom, the 1,000-year reign of Jesus Christ on the earth. If they neglected to care for God's people, then they were sent into the lake of fire. Now, the question is, and we want to look at this, the question is, Well, what are the different views of this parable and which one do do we think is correct? The first view, if if you read any, a lot of older commentaries especially, the first view sees the parable of the sheep and the goats as a sifting of genuine Christians from imposters. The idea is that if you're truly born again, the natural fruit of your faith will be that you will take care of the the least of these. You will take care of those in prison. You'll take care of those who are homeless. You'll take care of those who are hungry and thirsty. You'll take care of those who are naked or whatever. And and so the the idea is that the true Christians, if they're saved by faith, their, their works will then be demonstrated by what they do. They will care for the least of these. That's view number one. Now, I see some real weaknesses with that view that I want to say here. The the first weakness is that this view, and and again, this this view, if you you ever see any mercy ministries, they always use the scripture that we want to care for the least of these, which is awesome, by the way. I think it's awesome to take the scripture and apply it to motivate people to care for those in need. That's awesome. But the, the problem is this scripture has... By, with this view is detached from the context. Context matters when we interpret Scripture. 
context is critical. We've got to go back to the context. The context is the end of the age. The Lord talking about the end of the age. The context is when Jesus comes back in his, on his, in his glorious second coming and sits in Jerusalem. The context of this matters greatly. And so this general view that it's a sifting of genuine Christians from imposters, to me, is divorced from the context. It's divorced from the context. Make sense? You're kind of just sitting there going, what on earth is he talking about? You still there? Okay, so the, the, that's the first weakness I see. Is the, 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 that interpretation is divorced from the context of the Lord's second coming. The second weakness, and this is a big one, is that it teaches salvation by works. In other words, if you care for the least of these, then that, then you, in other words, if you, if you show care for the least of these, if you visit prisoners, if you visit the sick, et cetera, if you care for those people, then you will be, you will enter into the kingdom of God. But if you neglect it, it's not even persecuting. If you neglect to care for the least of these, then you'll go to hell. I don't see how you, you can get around the idea. This is teaching a gospel of works. And we went through Galatians, and one thing we know clear about Galatians is Paul was very clear, it's the gospel of salvation by grace through faith apart from works. To me, this view is teaching salvation by works. I don't see how you can get around that idea. It's saying that if you do these things, you're going to go into heaven. If you don't do these things, you're going to go to hell. So, therefore, I don't believe this is a general universal judgment of to distinguish between true Christians and those who are not Christians. I don't believe that view can be sustained, in my opinion. Make sense? Well, that's not very encouraging. Only one person to make sense to. So, the second view is that it's the judgment of individual Gentiles who survive the Great Tribulation. So, this view, which is good, this view correctly understands the context of this parable seeing it as a specific judgment after the Great Tribulation when Jesus is enthroned in Jerusalem. In addition, this, this view sees that the, the, uh, the nations that gathered to Jerusalem are not nations themselves, but individual Gentiles. They are neither born again, they, they, they are not saved, uh, but they, not, they did not bow down to the Antichrist in his three and a half year reign. And they survive the Antichrist reign without worshiping him, without taking the mark of the beast. And they also survive God's judgments. And so this, this view says, okay, it's the individual Gentiles from all the nations. They gather to Jerusalem. And then, and then Jesus says, okay, you cared for my people, uh, the church and Israel, during the great tribulation when they were persecuted by the Antichrist. Therefore, you're going to enter into the millennial kingdom. And the, and the others, he's going to say, you did not care for them. You neglected to care for them. Therefore, you're going to go to hell. So I again see a, two big weaknesses with this view. The first one is the, just the logistical weakness. Think about this for a second. There's about 8 billion people right now on planet Earth. And let's just say, just to make it simple, let's say that Revelation 6.8 and Revelation 9.15 tell us about half the world is not going to survive the judgments of the Lord. That leaves us with 4 billion people. Let's just make it simple. 1 billion are saved, born-again Christians. 1 billion worship the Antichrist. That now leaves us with 2 billion uh, survivors of the Great Tribulation that are not saved and did not worship the Antichrist. Does that make sense? They resisted the Antichrist, which I, I think Scripture can support that. Now, just to make it simple, let's just say that let's just say that instead of two billion, it's one point three or two billion. It's one point three billion. There's one point three billion survivors of the Great Tribulation. That's the population of India. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen India on a map compared to Israel. I've been to India. Every square inch of that nation is populated. I mean, I don't know if you've ever seen the, the trains in India where there's literally, there's, there's people hanging off the, the top of the train holding on for dear life. 
So, and my, my point is that the, the, the population of India is very dense. The population of India is very dense. And so just to think that you would have 1.3 billion people come into the nation of Israel, to me, just doesn't make sense. I just can't imagine that happening. So I, I think there's a weakness logistically. I think there's also, again, a theological weakness that, again, is teaching salvation by works, that that if you cared for the Jews when they were being persecuted and you cared for the church when they were being persecuted, you would go into heaven. And if you didn't care for them, then you would be gone, you would go into hell. So I still think there is a logistical weakness and a theological weakness there. The third view, which is the view I believe that is the accurate view, and I'm going to explain why, is that it's a judgment of nations that determines their eternal destiny. See, a lot of times we don't think of nations having a destiny, but they do. The scriptures are clear. Read, for example, read Isaiah chapter 19. You see there's the destiny of Egypt. There's the destiny of Israel. There's the destiny of Assyria. So, so, and and those, those three nations have an incredible destiny in, in the millennial kingdom when Jesus Christ comes back. And so there is a destiny of nations. Nations have an eternal destiny. And so the, what, what I believe this parable is teaching is not, you know, two billion people gathering to Jerusalem to be judged. It's more the leaders of the nations gathering to Jerusalem and those leaders being evaluated on whether or not they, they, uh, they um, were nations of refuge for God's people when they were persecuted. So just think of it like this. Let's look at Matthew 25. Matthew 25 the Lord says, I was hungry, in verse 35, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. Well, think about the context of that. The great tribulation, the mark of the beast. You can't buy or sell without that mark. So God is going to provide, I believe, in, it, with, I believe God wants to have uh, nations and cities of refuge that would provide food and drink for God's people that don't take the mark of the beast. Think about that. It's interesting. I was a stranger and you invited me in. In other words, come to this place of refuge. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. In other words, I was in prison. You came to me. In other words, we see clearly, in my opinion, this is not just any old time. It's what is going on during the great tribulation when the Antichrist is ruling and reigning. Is, is there's hunger and thirst and sickness and homelessness in prison. And God wants there to be people that, like Corey Ten Boom, that would take care of, these, of God's people in that time. Make sense? So now let's go in and let me explain why I believe that's, th this is what Matthew 25 is teaching. So let's turn to Joel chapter 3. See, whenever you come to the scriptures, you can't just come to the scriptures, you can't just come to the scriptures and detach them from the original context, nor can you detach coming to the New Testament without understanding the Old Testament. When, when Jesus taught the parable in Matthew 25 about the judgment of the nations, I believe he was, he was uh, alluding to the judgment of the nations in Joel chapter 3. Another, another example, in, in the Olivet Discourse, Jesus said, Then you will see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet. Well, you really can't understand you really can't understand what the abomination of desolation is in Matthew 24 if you don't go back to the original context in Daniel to understand what did Daniel think the abomination of desolation meant. So to understand New Testament, you also have to understand the Old Testament. Make sense? So Joel chapter 3, 1 through 8 is describing the nations being judged. So, so look at this. It's, it's really the same thing that's happening in Matthew 25. For behold, in those days and at that time, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, that's talking about the restoration of Israel. That's talking about, in context, the final restoration of Israel when Jesus comes back, the Messiah comes back, and he rules and reigns from Jerusalem. That he will gather all the nations. See that? Same thing that's happening in Matthew 25. Almost the exact same language. 
He, he will gather all the nations and he will bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. The valley of Jehoshaphat, if you've ever been to Israel, I've been there twice. The, the valley of Jehoshaphat is this narrow valley. It's now called the Kidron Valley, right, at, right in the center of Jerusalem. And it's this tiny, it's really not big at all. So you could, you know, when, when you see that the nations are going to come down to the Kidron Valley in Jerusalem, you realize, okay, there's not a lot of real estate there. So you could not bring billions of people there. So, and that's another logistical thing to consider when you think about this. But here the Lord says, then I will enter into judgment with them there on behalf of my people and my inheritance, Israel whom they have scattered among the nations and they have divided up my land. So we, when we compare Joel 3 with Matthew 25, you get an exact parallel. It's the time when Jesus comes and sits on his throne in Jerusalem. It's the time of Israel's final restoration. And you see in both passages that the nations in Matthew 25 and Joel 3 are gathered to Jerusalem for judgment. Make sense? Seeing that these two events are the same, looking at Joel chapter 3 will give us insight into Matthew chapter 25. And again, again, just, just, think, just take one step back. This is a lot, this is kind of a little technical. Don't lose sight of what we're trying to establish here. Is we're trying to establish in God's heart for nations to be nations of refuge at the end of the age. All right? So just keep that in mind. Or you'll be like, man, you're getting too in the weeds there for me. Okay, so let's ask ourselves this question. We see, okay, on behalf of my people and my inheritance Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations, they divided up my land. Let's ask the question, who is responsible for scattering the Jews into the nations and who is responsible for dividing up God's land? Individual Gentiles or leaders in nations? That's pretty simple, right? So in 2005, or back in 2002, we had what was called the Quartet. The Quartet was a, was a Mideast plan that involved America, the EU, Russia, and the United Nations. And, and what they wanted to do, I don't know if you remember that or not, but what they wanted to do is they wanted to divide up Israel, and they wanted to give the land of Israel to the Palestinians in exchange for peace. And so, you know, in 2005... I remember this, we were, uh, I remember this very clearly, is we as a nation were very instrumental in causing the Jewish people to leave Gaza. And so we said, okay, this land, Gaza, is going to be taken from the Jewish people and given to the Palestinians, and therefore we're, we're the ones going to divide up this land. And they ultimately wanted to divide up the West Bank and East Jerusalem. And so the question then is, were, were, were you responsible for that? You know, were you responsible for dividing up Israel or was it the leaders in our nation who were responsible? The leaders. See what I'm saying? So, it, you know, there's no way God would hold us accountable for dividing up his land when we had no power and no sway to do any of that. The point being is that the judgment of the nations is not on individual Gentiles, it's on the leaders of Gentile nations at the end of the age. So here's my, uh, so, and then you, you just look in Joel chapter 3, verse 4. You see again, this, in context, you see this is a specific judgment of the nations. Moreover, what are you to me, O or, or Tyre and Sidon, and the regions of Philistia. Those are nations. Those are not individuals. See, the Lord, is, the Lord is entering into judgment on nations, not individuals. Are you rendering me a recompense? And he goes down. He goes down and uh, he talks about in, um, in verse, let's see, in verse 9, I believe. Not 19. Verse 19 it's still the judgment of the nation. It says, Egypt will become a waste, Edom a desolate wilderness, because of the violence done to the sons of Judah, in whose land they have shed innocent blood. So the point is, these are nation states that are being judged, not individuals. These are specific nations being judged, not individuals. God works, if you, if you just read the scriptures, you see this very clear. God works 
on behalf of leaders is always the few for the many. Read Romans 5, 12 through 21. It is Adam, and Adam represents humanity, and what, the, way, the way Adam responds affects all of humanity. The same could be said with Jesus Christ. Adam, Jesus represents uh, the humanity, and through his crucifixion, he provides justification and salvation to all. And so here you see, I, I believe the judgment of the nations in both Matthew 25 and Joel chapter 3 is a judgment on the leaders of the nations who survived the great tribulation. And the Lord's going to gather them together. It's kind of like the Nuremberg trials after World War II. What, what happened in the Nuremberg trials in World War II is the, the, there was a military tribunal, and they gathered together all the different people of the Nazi party. This was not all the Germans were gathered. It was the, end of, it was the people that were responsible for what happened politically economically in terms of what happened during the Holocaust, they were gathered and they were gathered for the Nuremberg trials that the same type dynamic is going to happen at the end of the age when the Lord judges the nations. Nations and cities have a destiny. And, and the Lord even talked about that in Matthew 11, 20 through 24. Nations and cities have a destiny. You see that even in Matthew 11, 20 through 24. He told Capernaum, he said, you are, you are not going to ascend to heaven. You are, gonna, you are going to descend to hell. See, nations and cities have a destiny. We don't think like that, but the Lord does. The Lord thinks that way. So let's tie it all back together here. The point is, is that um, there are God's heart, and I believe we're living in this time right now, by the way. God's heart is for the nations, for those like America. Well, I'm just going to take America, just, and there's other nations, I'm sure, but, but just because I'm an, I live in America, God's heart is for America to be a sheep nation. God's heart is for America to resist the Antichrist agenda. God's heart is for America to resist the, what's, what's trying to take place in this nation, to resist it, to fight it, to contend for what the destiny God has for this nation. We are not just to sit back and say, okay, do whatever you want because God has sovereignly declared this. No, we're to fight and contend in prayer and intercession for the destiny that's in God's heart for this nation. God wants this nation to be a nation, just like John Winthrop said, a, a nation of refuge, a nation who will resist the Antichrist, a nation who will care for God's people in their distress, in their persecution. That is what we are fighting for right now. I believe it is God's heart for America to fully enter into her end time destiny as a sheep nation. And we need to pray and fight and to contend for that because it's very important to God. I believe it's so in the heart of God that America would enter fully into her end time destiny. I don't believe we've entered into it fully yet. I believe we are in, a, in the valley of decision. We're in the valley of decision right now. Will America remain a constitutional republic or will we align with global socialism? That is where we're at right now. That's the valley of decision we are facing. We are, we are in that valley of decision to see will America remain the constitutional republic and, and really be that place of freedom of religion where there's, where there's no persecution allowed in this country or will we align with that with a, a, a more a, 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 an agenda that's removing freedom and liberty? That's what we're battling for. That's what we're contending for. And so I just want to encourage us right now. Don't grow weary in well-doing. I know we are in a battle for the heart and soul of America. Intercessors are weary. And I, I know intercessors are tired, they're weary, but we cannot quit the fight. We cannot quit the fight. And I know we just had Thanksgiving holidays, and the last thing you want to think about is contending and fighting for America. But I'm telling you, we've got to get back into that fight. We've got to get back into that place of contending. I, I guess the way I feel is like never before have I been more stirred up to fight for God's destiny for America. I mean, you see the, the sacrifice the pilgrims made, the sacrifice 
the Puritans made. And, and just even thinking about, you know, God, if you think about, if you see history through God's eyes and the destiny of America through God's eyes, here God brings over the Puritans or, or the, the pilgrims. Then he brings over the, pil, the, the Puritans. And then, in about 100 years or so go by, and there's this man, George Whitfield, from England. And George Whitfield has this burden, this vision. He said, I must sail to America, and I must bring the 13, col- the 13 colonies of America as one nation under God. And God releases the first great awakening, led by Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield and the Wesleys. God poured out his spirit, and this nation that was started by the pilgrims and the Puritans. This nation had had this incredible outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And then we share this story so often, but right before the Revolutionary War, the 13 colonies, the leaders of 13 colonies, gathered together and they said, we are not going to serve the King of England any longer. We have no king but Jesus. And you see God in his sovereign hand uh, guiding the destiny of this nation. People who say America does not have a God-given destiny are telling you a lie. I'm telling you, God has a destiny for this nation, and it's a destiny we must fight for. It's a destiny that we must contend for, that we would fight for America to remain a sheep nation, that we would fight that America would come in to her ultimate end-time destiny and be that sheep nation that would be a place of refuge from the persecution that's coming from the Antichrist and the years that, that lie ahead. So I would say, and I want to encourage us, even the younger ones, let's fight for the destiny of this great nation. Let's fight and contend and wage war and intercede and stand in the gap that God's will for America would be done. Amen? We're not going to surrender. We're not just going to lay down passive and say, what will be, will be. No, we're going to fight. We're going to, we're, going to take, uh, we're going to take the battle up in prayer and intercession. We are going to pray and we're going to cry out to God that his will would be done for this nation. I want, when I, I, I want so badly, I want so badly when Jesus comes back, And he gathers the nations together. And he gathers the leaders of the nations together in Jerusalem. I want so badly for him to look at the leaders of America and say, you took care of my people in their distress. When the Antichrist put on the mark of the beast where you could not buy or sell, you were a nation that took care of my people. You were a nation that was for Israel. You were a nation that did not persecute my people. When you saw them hungry, you fed them. When they were thirsty, you gave them drink. When they were banned in prison, you sent visitors there to encourage them. And you brought them as strangers into your land. I want America to be that sheep nation at the end of the age. That is worth fighting for. That is worth contending for. That is worth saying, what, no matter the cost, no matter the price, we are going to fight. And I'm talking about fighting spiritual warfare. We're going to fight in prayer and intercession for the destiny of America, no matter the cost and the price. We cannot allow this great nation, I believe it's the greatest nation that's ever existed, this great nation to, to miss the incredible destiny God has for us at the end of the age. I'm in for the long haul. How about you? Amen? I'm in to say, God, until you come back, no matter what happens, we are contending for the destiny of a nation to be a sheep nation at the end of the age. Amen.